Okay, so today we're going to talk about the neurosystem, specifically traumatic brain injuries, which encompass um, skull fractures, um, which are considered open open injuries. Um, we have closed head injuries, which are concussions, contusions, and diffuse axonal injuries. Um, we'll talk about brain bleeds, uh, lacerations. We'll talk about um, Glasgow Coma Scale, um, um, in, in, intracranial pressure, ICP, and I, ICP monitoring, um, and all the things that go into that, and brain death. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, now with um, traumatic brain injuries, if there's an injury or trauma to the brain, it's going to be different than if you have an injury or trauma to the rest of the body. So let's say like if I sprain my ankle, for example, um, you know, inflammation occurs whenever there's a trauma or an injury, right. To bring blood to the area, uh, you know, all the sort of things to help heal it. Right now, that's not really a problem. I'm not worried if my ankle starts swelling up. Right. I mean, I'd be uncomfortable, but I'm not worried about any life altering complications. Now with neuro, it's different, right? Because um, if your brain starts to swell, well, your brain is inside of something that's hard, your skull, right? So the skull is, um, is not expandable, right? So if your brain starts swelling inside of your skull, it starts swelling, starts pressing against, you know, the cage that it's in, so to speak, the, the skull, and it's going to cause some serious problems. Um, your brain has nowhere to to stretch out, if that makes sense. Like my ankle, you know, it could swell up to be the size of a softball and it's fine because it has room to expand. Whereas your brain has no room to expand because the skull is there compressing it. So, um, you know, if that's what we call intracranial pressure increasing, right? And if that occurs, we have all sorts of problems, brain death, um, comas, all these things, which we don't want to have. So the biggest thing with uh, traumatic brain injuries is, is the intracranial pressure, how to keep that down um, so that we don't end up with something permanent, brain dead, or, or something like that. Um, now, there's three things within the, uh, inside the skull that could be contributing to intracranial pressure. You have the, you have blood, right? So if you were to have like a brain bleed, for example, a lot of blood rushing um, inside the brain or like a big brain bleed, and all of a sudden you have all this fluid that's building up that can cause, that can increase your intracranial pressure, um, which is bad, right? We just, we just discussed. So blood can increase the, the pressure, like if an aneurysm or something, uh, you have cerebrospinal fluid, the fluid that, you know, helps lubricate everything. Um, if you, for whatever reason, have started having overproduction of CSF, that cerebral spinal fluid, the CSF, that can increase the pressure. And then also the brain tissue itself. So if the brain starts the, the brain tissue itself starts swelling. Um, so those are three things that inc that can potentially increase the pressure. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is if there's, if you're, um, you know, someone on the scene and someone has like a, a car accident or something and someone presents with some kind of head trauma where they fall or they get in a car crash or something like that. And, um, we treat all head traumas as if they have, um, spinal cord injury until proven otherwise. So that's why you'll see people put like a C collar on patients before they move them. Um, because we don't know, we can't see into that patient. We don't have x-ray vision to know if they do or do not have, um, like a C spine fracture. And the reason why we want to be really careful is because this whole area is the airway, right? So, and we also want to prevent paralysis, snapping of the spinal cord and everything. So if you have, if anyone has a head trauma, um, we always put them in a C collar until they've had x-rays to prove um, whether or not they have a fracture. That's just to be careful. Okay, so with that being said, that little background, let's go ahead and jump into fractures. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with that. So these are fractures are considered um, open injuries, right? Because, you know, um, if you cut through the skin, let's say I hit, get hit in the head with a baseball bat, gut punctures the skin, punctures the skull, and it fractures it, I have an open injury. Right. And what are we worried about with that is infection, right? If, if it cracks my skull um, and suddenly my brain has, or the, the air has access to the brain, we're worried about, you know, developing meningitis, um, you know, infection getting in. So that's what we would be concerned about with, with open fracture. So there's different fracture types. Fractures, there's a linear fracture. Uh, there's a comminuted fracture, if you can see that on the board. Um, there's a depressed fracture. I'm not writing too tiny for you to see. 
Uh, maybe I can move this a little bit forward. Yeah. I don't know if that helps at all. And then there's basilar fracture. And so let's talk about these. Linear fracture, these are pretty straightforward because huh, they're in a straight line. Huh. Um, so it's like this is the skull. A linear fracture would just be huh, a fracture in the shape of a line. Pretty standard. Um, the comminuted, oh, and the linear ones are also the least fatal. So these come with the least complications. Um, as you'll probably figure out, um, you know, a, a simple line like that is easier to heal, easier to keep together. Comminuted, this one is, if you've ever seen, like, if you were taking an egg, like a hard-boiled egg, and you, um, like, you kind of, you know, you try to crack it, you, like, what's the, what's the word? Like, pressing it, like, again, like, knocking it against the side of a hard surface, and, like, you see, like, the eggshell starts to crack. That's what comminuted looks like. So it's, like, if, if the skull were an egg, you know, have like these like cracks in here, just like you would expect with like an eggshell if it started to um, started to break. There's like an awkward glare there. There you go. Um, so the problem with this one is that it's just like an eggshell where it like you know just cracks up all these tiny little fragments. And sometimes if you don't get them all off, you can like bite into the hard boiled egg and like you take bites of shell fragments and it's not it's not very good. So um, and you don't want these skull fragments like chilling in the brain or poking the brain or being left in there. So we'll have to have surgery to remove those. Um, a depressed fracture, um, this is like if someone were to take like a blunt force and bang your head in and it literally just like the skull kind of gets dented in like that, right? So you can probably think a problem with this is like it's pressing in on the, if the brain's inside, it could be pressing in on that brain, increasing that intracranial pressure because now you just made the inside area smaller than it was before. Right. Okay, next one is basilar. And so this one is anything that occurs like at the base of the skull. Um, and this one's gonna come with the more complications. So like if this is someone's face and that's their skull, it's awkward looking, but it's okay. Um, basilar fracture would occur like here. You can also have a basal fracture like occur down here. Um, and it's, what you can do to kind of tell is that there'll be certain signs and symptoms that you can see in a person that have these. Um, so for example, if like someone has a basal fracture here, you might see bruising behind the eyes if this is where the eyes are, because um, the, you know, it occurred right there. Um, we call that raccoon eyes because they'll have like these, um, you know, kind of like the kind of black eyes kind of looking like. Um, they might have, um, I think their ears located about here, right? So they have basilar fractures kind of here, there. They might have a bloody tympanic membrane, um, which you can see with an otoscope. Um, they might also have something called battle sign, which is bruising behind that ear. So bruising back here, bruising around the eyes. So raccoon eyes, battle sign. I guess they call it battle sign because I guess if people are like hitting each other. Someone might punch you in the, in the head, like right there uh, as you're receiving a blow and get like a bruise back there. I don't know, I think of like boxers, they're like, you know, throwing punches and then one hits a punch there. I don't know, so that's a battle sign. And this one is the raccoon eyes. Okay. Um, the other thing you might see with the eyes is nystagmus. I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's where your eyeballs are kind of like involuntarily twitching or like shaking. Um, and that's, you know, related to just the inflammation and the irritation of like the swelling kind of being right behind, right behind that area. Um, and then you might also have some hearing issues if there's inflammation or swelling um, related to like the tympanic membrane, the swelling behind that, and the, the bloody tympanic membrane. So those are some things you might expect to see with a basilar skull fracture. Some treatments that you'd want to do if someone has a basilar skull fracture. Um, is you want to keep the head of the bed elevated at like 30 degrees. Um, this will help to, if you're like, think about it, if you're laying down flat, the blood and the gravity is going to take it, like the, the fluids to your head. If you're sitting up slightly, gravity will help to keep some of that fluid down, keep it drained, um, so you're not building up more inter intracranial pressure. You want to tell them, uh, that your patients to avoid things that are going to, like, uh, cause sharp increases in 
intracranial pressure, like coughing, sneezing, blowing your nose or straining. Anytime you're like bearing down, like coughing, like you're, such, like you're tensing up, it's like, it's like a short burst of pressure. And we don't want that. It could rupture some more things. Um, you wanna try and keep as much pressure, like low pressure as possible. So uh, let's see, no coughing. I mean, obviously you can't always <laughs> prevent coughing or sneezing, but it's the best that you can. Don't blow your nose. Um, and straining. So if someone's got constipation, maybe giving them some colates to help them not have to strain, which will increase the, the pressure. If they're coughing, sneezing, maybe give them some allergy medicines. I don't know. Um, the other thing is to not let this person have anything go up their nose. So because again, we have this fracture right here and we, and we don't know exactly you know, we can't tell by looking without an x-ray exactly where the fracture is. If you put an NG tube, and this has happened, people put an NG tube down the patient and, you know, the nose is attached to the skull, right? So what happens if the NG tube goes through the fracture and then goes into the brain? And now you're suddenly giving tube feed into their brain instead of um, into their stomach. That's a problem. Like that's, that would kill someone. So if they've got basal fracture, no NG tubes, nothing going down the nose. Um, I can't do something about this glare. I don't like it. Let's see if I can maybe bring this forward a little bit. That helps at all. Okay, so nothing down the nose. Um, there, I've actually seen x-rays of people that like you can literally see the NG tube coiling up in their brain because the NG tube went through the nose, through the opening in the skull from the fracture and went to the brain. So we don't want that, obviously. Um, what else? So nothing down the nose. Um, some more treatments. Put no NG tube, right? Um, let's see, what else? So with your assessments, obviously you're gonna be assessing vision and hearing and smell, right? Obviously these are all the, the senses concerned with this area that can be affected by the basal, the basal or skull fracture. Um, we're gonna definitely focus on um, looking out for signs of symptoms of meningitis. Um, why meningitis, you might think? Well, again, we mentioned that in the beginning where like an open, an open um, injury, you know, allows elements from the outside to come in, into the brain, which is bad. But especially if they have a basal, basal fracture like right around here, right, right like behind the nose, because the nose isn't sterile, right? And people are like blowing their nose, people with stuff gets up their nose, and easily seep through and get in there. Um, so what are we looking for with meningitis? Well, obviously fever, fever would indicate infection. Other things with um, meningitis uh, are the nuchal rigidity, the neck stiffness. Um, so any, any signs of that, we're gonna think, okay, uh, this isn't good. The other two things that you can look for for meningitis are, let me write this down. So meningitis, right? We're watching for that. And this isn't just basilar, this is all fractures with the skull. I just tend to focus on it more with the basilars because of the proximity to the ears, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. It's like a very unsterile environment. So nuchal rigidity, right? The other one is Koenig's sign, kind of a weird name, Koenig's sign. Koenig's sign is um, the one where the patients are unable to straighten out their legs. They kind of just stay like in this tucked position. I kind of think of it like, I kind of picture a frog. You know how the frogs are kind of like in that squatty position whenever you like see a cartoon or whatever. And Koenig sounds like Kermit to me, like Kermit to the frog. So I just think Kermit sounds like Koenig, which is the bent knees, the kind of a squat-like position, just because they have a lot of hamstring tightness. I guess it's just tightness, like, you know, the nuchal rigidity, the hamstring rigidity, they, they aren't able to straighten it out. So Koenig, Kermit, just a kind of memory helper. And then the other one is the Brodzinski's sign. I don't have a fancy way to remember this one. Sorry, <laughs> but this one is uh, when, like when you're doing your assessment, if you bring a, a patient's head to their, to their, sorry, their chin to their chest like this, it'll cause their knees to spring up just because it just triggers that, that reaction. Um, and so if you see any of those things, those are signs of meningitis, and we definitely want to bring that to uh, the provider's attention immediately. 
Um, so those are basically the main concerns for open fracture, um, again, focusing on infection, uh, that sort of thing. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase these. The only other thing that I missed um, is that if you have a skull fracture, the other thing you're gonna wanna check for is um, leaking of cerebrospinal fluid, right? We got cerebrospinal fluid in our brains, in our heads, underneath the skulls. And um, anytime that there's a fracture and it's open, it could be leaking out, right? And frequently you'll see like fluid coming out of the ears or the nose because there are already drainage sites. So one of the things you can do to test if there's cerebral spinal fluid is called the halo sign. Halo sign, what you do, like let's say someone's, this is an ear. <laughs> let's say someone's got some drainage coming out their ear, right? What you can do is take a gauze, like your normal, like a little square piece of gauze, dip it into the, the drainage. Um, and typically, typically you won't be able to, you won't be able to tell by looking at it. If it's cerebral spinal fluid or not, because it's going to be mixed blood, right? So it might just, might just look like red fluid coming out. So you're like, hmm, I wonder if this is just blood or if this is just, you know, regular liquid or if this is like actual cerebral spinal fluid. Because if it's cerebral spinal fluid, you might have a problem because the cerebral spinal fluid needs to stay in there, right? And if we have too much cerebral spinal fluid, that increases the intracranial pressure. If we have too little and it all drains out, we also run into problems. So you want to keep it where it's supposed to be. So what you do is you dip it in, um, and I guess I can use red because it'll be bloody looking. So you dip like a corner piece of the gauze into the drainage, and you'll see like, okay, here's the bloody spot. You'll start to see what's called a halo sign, where you'll like have the bloody part here, but then the cerebrospinal fluid, if there is cerebrospinal fluid, will kind of leak out to the edge and make like this halo, right? So it's, you know, if, if it were, all the way around, it would be like circling it like, like an egg yolk, but it's supposed to be like a halo, right? Um, so this part would be a little bit yellowy, so it wouldn't be as dark as the color in the middle. So like you'd be like, oh look, there's like a ring of more clearer fluid surrounding the, the dark center of the blood. And if that happens, um, that is a positive halo sign. Uh, you can also do a dipstick. So like say there's a bunch of drainage coming out and you dip it or kind of like we do like a urine a urine dipstick or like testing for pregnancy or testing for cerebral spinal fluid um a positive dipstick would show positive for glucose and positive for chloride um so when you're you know testing testing the liquid the drainage whatever the out the nose the ear um if it's positive for these two things likely to be cerebral spinal fluid um, just because it has glucose and chloride in it. I like to think of it as sweet and salty, you know, sodium chloride. So if it's sweet and salty, you can remember that's another way to test for the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, I think that's pretty much it about the CSF leak. So I'll go ahead and erase this now. Okay. Next thing is for closed head injuries. So this would be like concussions, contusions, and the diffuse axonal injuries. So we'll start with concussions. I think most people are more, are more uh, familiar with these just because it's kind of a common everyday thing that people uh, talk about. Go ahead and turn this light off so you can see better. There we go. No more glare. Everyone's happy. Okay. So concussions, um, these are from like shaky movements. Um, you know, sad, one of the sad examples of this is like shaken baby syndrome. Um, I don't know if you know what that is. Uh, you know, where parents, sometimes not even meaning to, like a child is crying and they just want to get them to stop and they're just like shaking the child, be like, please stop crying. And obviously never do that because little babies, they don't have the neck muscle that like we do to keep our head still. Their head will just kind of wobble all around. And that shaken movement can give them like concussion. Um, so it can be anywhere from mild to severe. Um, mild concussions, no big deal. Severe, more serious. Um, some signs and symptoms of a concussion, probably know most of them. Dizziness, headache, obviously. Um, memory loss, you've, you've, I'm sure you've seen like several movies people like had a con con concussion and lost their memory. Um, they might have a loss of consciousness where like they pass out 
and then wake up. Um, hopefully it's brief. Um, they might have personality changes, you know, temporarily where they're more irritable than usual. Um, so some of the treatments that we can do, personality. Um, treatments um, for the first two days, you want to wake them up every three to four hours. So not letting them sleep for long periods of time. Um, and I've probably heard that kind of like circulating around from people kind of like wives tales, but it's actually true. You don't want them to sleep for very long. Um, also, you don't want to give them any narcotics or sedatives for the first 24 hours. So no narcotics, no sedatives. So if they're in pain, you're gonna to have to give them something else like Tylenol or something like that. Um, but they don't need to depress the brain any more than it already is. They already just went under some trauma. So we're not wanting to, you know, go into a coma, right? Because excess sleep or narcotic sedatives can put the brain under and we don't want that. We wanna keep it awake. <laughs> um, so that's concussion. We'll go ahead and erase this one. Next is contusions. So contusion is um, bruising at the site of the trauma. So like if this is the brain and um, let's say I, I'm running and I slam my head really hard into the wall, which I wouldn't do that, but like if on accident I were to slam my head into the wall, this is the site of impact in the front. So let's say this is someone's head, right? So if they hit the wall in the front right there, uh, the site of impact is going to have impact and damage right there, right? So it's going to have a bruise kind of right in there. This is called um, coop when it's on the site where it hit. And now let's say I'm in the car and driving and someone, you know, rams into me and I, my head snaps this way and also snaps back, right? So you might have that whiplash effect and get, have that, um, you know, you hit something and then like you go back and hit it again. So you would have the coop is on the site of impact and then the contra coop, contra coop is on the opposite side of the impact. Um, so some people can have both. Like if you get hit this way and your brain slams into the front of your skull and your neck snaps back and then your brain slams into the back of your skull, you can have both. Um, you not, might not always have both, but you can just have one. Like if I were to just slam my head really hard and not have it slap back. So coop is just the site where it hit, contra coop is the opposite side. Um, so those are the two types of contusions you can have. Um, let's talk about now the, the more kind of interesting one, the diffuse axonal injury. Diffuse axonal injury. I'm just gonna put DAI. And now let's take it back a little bit back to A&P and having physiology for those of you who have not even thought about axons in a long time. So I'm gonna do a quick little sketch reminder uh, of what an axon even is. So axons, you know, are important for sending action potentials, which is, you know, how your, um, your, your mind tells your body what to do. So the neuromuscular junction, right? So my brain to my arm, like I have to have an action potential to, to tell my arm to do this motion, right? Like an axon is firing from my brain to my arm muscles to tell it what to do. So that is done by these um, guys called axons, right? So So this in the center is called the cell body, right? These little arm tentacle like things are called the dendrites that receive the signals. This thing in the middle here is called, you guessed it, the axon. Um, and then these little squares around it are like the protective coating or the myelin sheath, which helps it um, conduct well and keeps it protected. So, these send the signals and then down here is just the axon terminals. So with a diffuse axonal injury, what happens is that somehow, I'm not actually really sure how this happens or like what, hap what kind of injury would cause this, but somehow the axons like 
twist, like, and this is the axon, it just like starts twisting around it, twisting around itself, like in a, like this kind of way, might even break, uh, break off. And that causes permanent damage to the axons, right? They don't recover from that. Um, you can go into a coma or severe intellectual damage um, and possibly associated with sympathetic nervous system disruption. So SNS disruption, sympathetic nervous system. And that's, you know, controls like blood pressure, heart rate, all of that, which makes sense because these fire off, um, they fire off the, the signals. So if these, if your nerves get, just get permanently damaged, you're probably gonna have uh, disruption there and it's not fixable, right? That you can't untwist and fix the, fix the axons, unfortunately. So that's what uh, diffuse axonal injuries are. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this. I think the most important part of that is knowing that you could have sympathetic nervous system disruption with, um, you know, like vital signs and things of that nature. Okay, so now we're going to move into brain lacerations or brain, ble brain bleeds, right? So I think that will be useful to actually draw a picture of the brain with the different meninges so you can kind of see it. Um, when I'm describing it, having an image in your mind is helpful. So this cloud is your brain, right? And then the very first layer after that is going to be this red line, the first meninge, and these are just like the layers um, surrounding the brain. That's going to be your pia mater, pia mater. After the next one above that, I'm going to do in green, and we'll do like this. So these are all like layers of protection surrounding the brain. They have different functions, but for right now, it doesn't really matter. This one's the arachnoid. And this kind of sounds like, you know, spider, like arachnophobia, like spider. And the reason being that is like, if you look at the like images of the arachnoid mater, it has like this weird spider webby kind of like consistency, kind of like these little things like that dangling off of them. Um, and then after that um, is the next layer. And we'll just kind of do it in a circle. This is the dura mater. Dura mater. And then after that, can you guess what the next thing is? It's the skull, right? So this black part, we can make it a little bit thicker. Well, this marker seems to be dying. So skull. So well, well, now that we have this image up, it'll probably be easier to understand um, the brain bleeds. Uh, brain laceration is just simply a tearing of the blood vessels. And depending on where the brain bleed occurs, um, there are different risks and different things to be aware of. So the first one is called an epidural hematoma. Now, epi uh, means above, right? And epidural, so we're gonna above the dura, right? So here's the dura. So epi is above. So it would be between the skull and the dura, right? So right in here, we have epidural hematoma. And a hematoma, if you remember, is like a big collection of blood. Um, so that would look like between here and here, like a brain bleed that occurs like that between the skull and the dura mater. So that would be a hematoma there. Um, the next one, or before we move on, the thing with this one is that these are very fast bleeders because they are arterial. So, you know, arteries obviously bleed really fast. If you were to puncture your radial artery, you'd bleed out a lot faster than if you just um, cut open a vein, right? Because it's got the pressure behind it. Um, these are fast bleeders. People might go in and out of consciousness and that surgery is required right away to number one, stop the bleeding, but also to, to get that hematoma out. They call it an evacuation of the hematoma. Why? I guess if you remember in the beginning, we talked about int intracranial pressure. There's three things that can increase it. Swelling of the brain tissue, right? Um, increasing of the cerebrospinal fluid, just an increase in that liquid or an increase of blood. Like I said, you have an aneurysm or something. So if you start having like tons of blood pooling up here, it's going to like, well, you're putting more 
you're put, trying to put more things into that confined space of the skull. So it's going to start squishing things around, right? You can't just keep putting more of something in a, in a tight area and not expect something to increase the pressure. So like, we don't want this, this blood spot to start increasing and pressing on the brain and like increasing the pressure. So you need to have surgery to stop the bleeding so you don't bleed out. And number two, to get that hematoma out so it's not increasing the pressure. Um, the next one is a subdural hematoma. Sub means below, like submarine, below the surface. And then again, we're talking about the dura. So the subdural goes here, subdural hematoma. So that would be between the dura and the arachnoid. So that would be like in here. Okay. So this one is venous, so it's going to be much slower bleed. Um, these tend to be common in older people, right? Um, and taking anticoagulants increase your risk for developing a subdural hematoma or an SDH. You might hear SDH thrown around as subdural hematoma. Older people, I'm going to put anticoags here, increase. Um, and then SDH, subdural hematoma. Um, and then the last, no, not the last one, I lied. Intracerebral. So this one's just pretty, you know, pretty straightforward. Intracerebral just means within the brain. Intra is in, cerebral is the, you know, the cerebrum. So just a brain bleed inside, that's intracerebral. And then there's also a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So where would subarachnoid be? Well, sub under subarachnoid. So that one would go here. Sub arachnoid. You might also hear this one referred to as an SAH. It's frequently used. Um, sub subarachnoid hematomas can be um, a result of an aneurysm, which is usually like a, a rupture of a vessel. Um, trauma, like falling, hitting your head, or something called AVM, arteriovenous malformation. And this is just something that people have. Um, you know how in the body, your arteries go, you know, feed, bring the nutrients and feed the cells. And then the cells, you know, when they're done, they send the blood back to the heart. So the arteries are coming with the blood and then, you know, it has the exchange here and then the exchange goes back into the veins and then it goes back to the heart. So we'll just put arteries here and veins here. Normally there's like a really good like interchange connection where they're just like linked really well. And an AVM or an ar arteriovenous malformation, it's just got these like, it's like this glob of like, well, malformed connections. And like, you can see it like on imaging, it'll just look like this ball. And these are like just twisted and like malformed um, vessels that are kind of all twisted together. And so like, these are weak and don't really serve a great purpose. And if like this ruptures or bursts, that'd be an SAH, a subarachnoid. So I'm going to just bring this close real quick so you can see it better. I don't know if you can see that or not. This camera is not the best situation, but it's okay. All right, put that back there. So those are the things for the brain bleeds. You know, one more time to see everything. You can push pause on the video if you need to. Okay, go ahead and put this back. Sorry for all the moving around. I'm trying to make sure everyone can see it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and erase this now. Goodbye, beautiful drawing. <laughs> All right. What's next? Uh, okay, next let's talk about um, the Glasgow Coma Scale or the GCS. This is just a handy tool to quickly um, evaluate a patient's neurostatus, right? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with like the app 
APGAR, um, you know, when you give a, you give a baby a, a number when they're born to kind of determine like, are they healthy or do they need to go to the NICU or what? So this is kind of one of those things, just kind of like a, a number scale to determine how well they're doing. And there's three factors that are looked at for the neurological status and that's their eye opening, their motor movements and their verbal. So let's start with eye opening. Now um, you get a score four down to one. You never go down to zero. So the lowest you can get for any category is a one. So the first one is eye open spontaneously. That's just like, you know, their eyes are open and they're looking around um, spontaneously. Like you don't have to like elicit them to open their eyes. The next one is um, if they're not opening their eyes spontaneously, maybe they're opening up their eyes to sound. So like their eyes are closed, but if there's a loud noise, then they startle and their eyes open. Um, but otherwise they don't have their eyes open for another reason unless there's sound. So that'd be a three. Um, you get, they would get two points if they open up their eyes to pain. So maybe you're talking to them saying, Hey, can you open your eyes for me? And nothing happens. And then like, maybe you do like a sternal rub or something, or like, you know, or like pressing on their nail beds to kind of get a pain response. And then they open their eyes. That'd be a two. And if they never open their eyes or have no response whatsoever, that'd be a one. So like, let's say you're trying, you're, you're, you know, you're yelling, hey, hey, can you hear me? Can you open your eyes to the patient? Uh, you're doing a sternal rub, trying to elicit pain response, nothing. They don't open their eyes. They get a one. Um, let's talk real quick about pain. Um, there's things that are appropriate and not appropriate to do to try to elicit a pain response for a patient. Um, two things that are not appropriate are nipple twisting or testicular twisting. Um, there's other things you can do that elicit pain that aren't um, demeaning or in people's personal private spaces. So those are just not good. Those are not okay. But the ones I did mention, like a sternal rub, you know, rubbing your knuckles right here, that will help, that should get someone's attention. And also like pressing in on those nail beds, like pressing hard uh, or taking like a marker or something hard and pressing on those nail beds, that, that hurts, right? But that's not like violating someone's privacy by kind of demeaning them by twisting the nipple or twisting the testicles. So these are um, the first one, the eye. The next one is motor. So you're assessing their motor response. Um, this one starts at six and goes down to one. So this one only has four, the motor has six possible. Um, so first one, six is if they, you know, obey commands and they're doing what you say, like, hey, can you lift your right arm? Hey, can you, you know, squeeze my fingers or whatever, they're obeying commands, they get six points. If uh, they're responding to pain, like, you know, you do the, the nail bed thing and they jerk their hand away, um, we know that they have, you know, their motor is pretty good, so they get five. But they may be like, they're only doing it not because they're obeying commands, but because they're just responding to the pain, right? So then four points would be if they're having normal flexion, um, normal flexion, you know, like maybe they're bunched up like this, uh, you know, they're in a pain position or whatever, normal flexion. The reason why there's a, a normal flexion is because the next one is abnormal flexion. So number three is abnormal. Um, so abnormal flexion um, is also called decorticate flexion. Decorticate. Um, and decorticate is, you can see it mostly like in their arms, like if they are flexed in like this with their arms inwards. And this kind of looks funny, but this is like a textbook picture of what de decorticate flexion looks like. Remember flexion is like when you bring your muscles in like this. So if they're just kind of stuck like this in this position rigidly, that's decorticate. Now the opposite um, is abnormal extension. So I should have put abnormal flexion here, sorry. This one's normal, abnormal, and then this one's extension. So extension is worse um, than flexion. I'm not really sure why, but it just is. And this one's also called decerebrate. Decer decerebrate, I'm sorry if I spelled this wrong. Um, decerebrate is when they're flexed 
out this way. So if they're kind of standing like this, this is a kind of a textbook picture of decerebrate. I can, like how you can remember the two different ones, the decorticate and decerebrate is for me, I think of the core, like, you know, how they talk about your core, like your belly, like core exercises. So they're pointed into the core. All right, so this is a decorticate and then decerebrate's the other one. And then uh, the, the last one is none, All right? So that's bad. And then I'm kind of running out of space over here. So I'm just gonna do it over here. So the last one is verbal. So what kind of verbal response are they having? This one goes from five to one. Sorry if this is hard to read. So number five, they get full points if they're alert and oriented and then they're talking with you and answering all your questions, perfect. They get four points if they're confused. And you know, we see these with like precious old people all the time, so they're like, they don't know where they are. They're confused about what day it is. They think that, you know, Big Bird is the president or whatever. So like they're talking and having like cohesive and coherent sentences, but they're just confused. Um, number three is if they're saying inappropriate words. Now this doesn't mean like saying the F word or, you know, curse words or whatever. Um, not that kind of inappropriate. Inappropriate would be like things that like don't fit the situation. I guess in psych, psychology you would call it like the word salad just kind of like saying random stuff like jingle bell hockey puck tennis ball I don't know like I just made up whatever but those are like okay why are you saying that like that makes no sense right and then two points would be if they're incomprehensible so you know this is like mumbling slurring garbling their words and you're like it's like what was that? Come again? That's incomprehensible. And then one point is if they don't say anything. Right? So this, um, you can probably figure out by now that the higher the score, the better, right? So the perfect score is, uh, you know, if they get four, six, and five, um, the lowest score anyone ever can ever get is three, one, two, three. And if someone has a GCS of three, they can either be dead or live, right? Because if they're not moving their eyes, moving their body or talking, they could be dead or they could be alive. Um, around the seven-ish, seven slash eight range, patients are typically um, in a coma, right? So this is just a handy dandy thing to kind of figure out um, how your patient's nerve status is doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase that now. Bye. So perfect score is 15, worst score is three. There is no zeros. Um, okay. Right, next, we're gonna talk about um, some more about intracranial pressure. We're gonna talk about a little bit, we're gonna talk about some more. Okay, so we know intracranial pressure is bad. We don't wanna increase that. Um, why? Um, because we need blood to be able to get to the brain. Right, so let's see if I can draw a picture here. Okay. Heart. Brain. Okay. So I'm going to introduce you to some new concepts. Um, first one being this idea of cerebral perfusion pressure. So Cerebral perfusion pressure. So basically what this means, cerebral perfusion pressure is the amount of pressure that is required to provide adequate blood flow to the brain. Okay, so we need blood flow, obviously, and you know the heart pumps the blood, so let's just call this an artery going to the brain. We need blood to get to the, to the brain, right? Obviously, because your brain needs blood like everything else. And so the cerebral perfusion pressure has to be high enough so that the, because it literally has to go uphill, so to speak, like your, your head is against gravity. 
right? Your heart has to pump up to get to the brain, whereas pumping to the rest of the body is pumping down. So gravity helps a lot. So the, I don't know what your, spe your specific numbers are for in, um, in your notes. When I was in school, they told us that the, the CPP, it's also called CPP, pressure, they wanted it between 70 and 110. If that's changed over the years, go with the, the latest findings, but this is just what I was taught when I was in school. Those numbers might be different, but it should be somewhere similar. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the pressure that the brain needs to have, right? 70 to 110 CPP to get brain, to get brain, sorry, to get blood up to the brain so you can function, right? Now there's also a uh, mean arterial pressure map. Um, and I'm just going to, mean arterial pressure is basically kind of another way to look at blood pressure. So, you know, we know all about blood pressure, you know, systolic and diastolic, all those things. How you, ca how you calculate someone's mean arterial pressure is you take their, um, you take their blood pressure reading. So let's say, let's say someone's blood pressure is 120 over 90. How you calculate the map is by doing um, the, the diastolic times two. So it'd be 90 times two plus the systolic, which is 120, right? And then divide that by three. So for those math people that like formulas, um, it's let me see how it is because I'm not a math person. I do not like formulas. So it's two times the diastolic blood pressure, right? Plus the systolic blood pressure divided by three, and that will give you your map. All right. So in this case, uh, the answer should be 100. That's what my notes say. I'm not going to verify if I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Um, so if you calculate this out, 90 times two plus 120 divided by three, that should be 100. So their map would be 100, okay? So why this matters is because when we're doing, when we're looking at the neurological status, um, you know, you got blood pressure, you've got cerebral perfusion pressure, you got intracranial pressure. How do these all work together? Well, the map or the, the blood pressure is referring to kind of like the pressure that's going on from the neck down, right? So the intracranial pressure is going to be different often than your blood, than your blood pressure in the, in the rest of your body. So there's one pressure from here down, think of that as map, right? And then the intracranial pressure is what's up here, right? So another formula coming to calculate where we want these numbers to be is it looks like this. And I'll explain this if it looks confusing. I'm going to write this in blue. Okay. So how to calculate this number, the CPP, is you do the MAP, which is the pressure in the body, minus the intracranial pressure, right? And that equals your CPP or your cerebral perfusion pressure. Now I'm going to explain this because I know a lot of people just went glassy eyed and probably like, oh my gosh, what in the world we're we talking about and have tuned out. Um, I promise it's not that bad. So like I said, the cerebral perfusion pressure is the amount of pressure that is required to perfuse the brain, right? So if you're looking at your body pressure, your MAP, which is the pressure from here down, right? And then you're subtracting from that the amount of pressure that's in the skull, right? the ICP, the intracranial pressure, um, that's going to tell us the CPP, right? Because let's say that your intracranial pressure is really, really high. Like you've got a brain bleed and you've got swelling in your brain. And so like your, your, everything in this area is like really constricted and really tight and like has a lot of pressure, right? Your heart is trying to pump blood up into it. All right, not only is it going uphill or, you know, against gravity, but now it's trying to squeeze blood into something that's already, already at a high pressure environment. It's already got a lot of pressure in there. So it's going to be very difficult for your, your heart to pump 
hard enough for it to go uphill and go into the brain system that's already like already inflamed and already swollen, right? So that's bad because we need blood to get to the brain to keep it perfused, to keep it alive and not dying, getting ischemia, right? So if the intracranial pressure is rising, you can expect that the heart is going to compensate by increasing its pressure, right? So if, you, if your intracranial pressure is really, really high, that means that your blood pressure or your MAP needs to get, also needs to be high to overcome the resistance of the intracranial pressure to perfuse the brain. So, right, so you can think of it this way, the intracranial pressure is the pressure that the heart or the MAP needs to overcome in order to perfuse the brain, which we call the CPP, the cerebral perfusion pressure, right? So if you take the pressure of the, of the heart or the MAP and you subtract, um, if you subtract from that, the amount of pressure that's in the brain, that'll tell you how much perfusion pressure they're getting, right? Because, you know, you, let's say you have X units of pressure coming from your heart, but the, pre and then it has to overcome whatever's left over after you subtract the intracranial pressure is the pressure that's left over to go into the brain. Hopefully that made sense. You rewind it a couple times. Um, so that's how I think of it. How it helps me is that the ICP is the pressure that needs to be overcome by the heart or the map. Maybe if I draw a heart there, that'll help you um, to, and whatever's left over once you take that away is your cerebral perfusion pressure, the amount of pressure that's actually getting to the brain. So now let's look at some numbers. We want the cerebral perfusion pressure to be between 70 and 110, right? Normal intracranial, um, I think it's, what is it? Three to 15, that's right. Okay, so let's, three to 15 is the range that we want the intracranial pressure to be. And then CPP, 70, 110, then we want the map to be above 90. Okay, so um, you can think about it this way. If the mathematically, right, if the intracranial pressure number is higher than the map is, well, then you're not getting perfused to the brain, right? Because if you do, like, let's put numbers here. If the map is, I don't know, 60 and the intracranial pressure is 70, well, 60 minus 70, you're in the negatives, right? Which means that you're having like negative 10 perfusion pressure in the brain, which is obviously less than 70 to 110. So you don't want your intracranial pressure to be bigger than your MAP. That's the biggest takeaway is that intracranial pressure should not be larger than the MAP. And as your intracranial pressure rises, your heart or your MAP has to also rise by compensating in order to overcome that resistance to get brain, sorry, to get blood to the brain. So let's look at some kind of practice problems over here. Not really problems, but just examples. So draw this over here. Okay, so let's say the person's map is 100, which ends up being, like I said, a blood pressure of 120 over 90. Can you see that? Let's see if I can get closer for right now. Okay, then what, how are we gonna calculate their ICP and their CPP? So ICP and CPP. So, well, we do MAP minus ICP equals CPP. And I'm just gonna tell you that the intracranial pressure is 15, which is in normal range. It's just high normal, right? So what does that leave your what does that leave your cerebral perfusion pressure to work with? Well, if you do the math, it ends up being 85. All right, because you do the body pressure, 100 minus the intracranial pressure, 15, and that leaves you with 85 units of cerebral perfusion pressure to perfuse the brain. Is that good? Well, we want 70 to 110, so that's good, right? we're getting adequate perfusion. Let's look at another one. Hopefully this is starting to make sense. Uh, let's look at another one here. Let's say their map, I remember this is referring to the heart, um, is 116 and that turns out to be a blood pressure of 150 over 100. Um, I'll tell you that their ICP 
is 25, which is high, right? How much perfusion pressure for the brain, or another way of thinking about this way is how much blood is actually getting to the brain. That's what cerebral perfusion pressure is, the amount of blood that's getting there to keep the brain alive. Um, so again, we do the math, 116 minus 25, and that equals 91. So is that good? Yes, that is in range. Congrats, we're good. Let's do another one. We'll just do a couple more, kind of make this make sense. I want everyone to feel comfortable. If you already feel comfortable and you don't want me to just keep talking, you can fast forward. Um, all right, let's look at this one. Someone's got a mean arterial pressure of 66, which corresponds to a blood pressure of 100 over 50. Their intracranial pressure is 40 and their CPP. So already you should see problems. Uh, first of all, their mean arterial pressure is only 66. We want it above 90, right? So that's already too low. Um, the intracranial pressure is 40, which is obviously higher than 15. Um, so 66 minus 40 gives you 26. Is that a good enough perfusion pressure to the brain? No, it is not. So this person is in trouble and it's not good. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, whenever your, whenever your um, intracranial pressure starts going up, your body's gonna compensate by increasing the blood pressure. Now, I know most people think, oh, increased blood pressure, that's bad. And in most circumstances, yes, especially for heart patients, like if you have heart failure, right? We don't want, your, we don't want you to have an increased blood pressure, right? Because you're putting more stress on the heart and you want the heart to be able to relax and not stress itself out so you don't throw like a myocardial infarction, right? But with neuro patients, um, we want the blood pressure to be high because the blood pressure has to increase whenever the intracranial pressure is high to overcome it so that blood can actually get to the brain, right? So when we see high blood pressure in, um, you know, in a neuro patient, that's actually better. Um, not like crazy high, but like higher than normal, um, like 140s, 150s. Um, your body's doing that on purpose to bring blood to the brain. So we kind of treat blood pressure differently depending on if they're a neuro patient or a cardio patient, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm going to erase this now. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about ICP. Okay, so we talked about that equation, but let's talk a little bit about it just in general. Um, so we're talking about, you know, numbers for intracranial pressure. Like, oh, we want it to be between three and 15, but it's like, well, how do you know that? Like. You can't just put a blood pressure cuff around their head and take their, you know, blood pressure around their head because that's not going to work. So in order to measure someone's ICP, um, you have, you know, ICP monitor, um, fancy monitor that tells you how much pressure is in the brain at any given moment. So there's different types. There's um, subarachnoid, which I wish I had my drawing up again um, so you can see that. There's intraventricular. These markers are dying. Um, intraparenchymal, which is also called intracerebral, I believe. Intraparenchymal, which intraparenchymal, and epidural. So a lot of these we kind of talked about with the bleeds, like epidural bleeds, arachnoid bleed. So these are just different places that a monitor can be placed literally into the skull, into the brain. So again, drawing my person. Um, that's the skull. I know my drawings are amazing. Um, okay, so subarachnoid is gonna look like, well, it's gonna be a bolt that's like literally like nailed into through the skull. Um, and I'm not going to draw the different layers again because I just don't feel like it. You can rewind and look at it if you have to. Um, so the subarachnoid, this bolt is going to be in here. It's going to be nailed in, strapped to their head so they can't move um, to measure the pressure within the subarachnoid space, right? 
And again, what do we worry about? Infection is the biggest one because you have like this thing that's open going into the body, right? We do not want any outside organisms getting into the brain. So infection control is literally the biggest thing with these ICP monitors. Um, the other one, intraventricular monitor, you know, like you have like the ventricles inside your brain. Um, well, you can have like a little probe that goes into the ventricles and it measures the cerebral spinal fluid in there. So it'll measure the CSF. Um, that's the intraventricular one. <laughs> um, the intraparenchymal, literally just the brain tissue. So this one can be inserted like a little probe literally going into the brain itself. So you know, this is the brain inside the skull. So just inside the brain matter. And then the last one is epidural. So that would be, you know, the one right below the skull. And then the next layer for that is the dura. So it's between the skull and the first layer. I'm just pretending that's the dura. So it would be a, like a little probe right there. So that would be the epidural. Um, not the best pictures, I'm sorry. Um, so these kind of just are monitors and probes that are at different points in the brain to measure the intracranial pressure. Uh, so that's where you get your numbers from. And again, we want it between three and 15. Right, so if someone has an intracranial um, monitor, um, again, infection is the biggest thing. You might also have a, vent a ventriculostomy bag. Um, so if someone's got an intraventricular probe, let's say this is the probe going into the ventricle and it's going like this and they have like the little doodad that gives the numbers or whatever. Oh, 15, good. And they also will have like, they could have what's called a ventriculostomy bag. So it's like a drainage system where like extra ex or excess CSF can drain into. So draining, right, and filling it up to, if they have an excess production of CSF, which is increasing the pressure, right, um, it can just kind of drain continuously. Um, the biggest thing is to like not empty it because when you open the system, um, you're increasing the risk of infection by having organisms go in and travel back to the brain, right? The other thing um, with these uh, ventriculostomy bag situations is that obviously when people are on these, the head of the bed needs to be elevated because um, again, we're trying to decrease the pressure. So at least 20 to 30 degrees head of the bed elevated. And the transducer, is the, you know, the doodad, which I drew over here, like the little thing that like measures that, um, this is called the transducer. I'm not super familiar with these because I've never actually worked with one in the in real life. I've seen them, but never had to like take care of a patient that's been on them. Um, but you're supposed to keep it um, level at the foramen of Monroe. So, so keep it level at the foramen of Monroe. Now, biggest one of the biggest things I've seen like in test questions about this is um, like if you reposition a patient and you move them up in bed or something, if you if you reposition the patient, you have to also reposition the the system to make sure it's in the right spot. Um, so checking it every shift, um, every position change, make sure it's correct. Um, that's pretty much it for the monitor itself. Not too much involved there. I'm gonna go ahead and erase that. Um, now let's talk about what some signs and symptoms would look like if you have developing, if you are developing an increase in your ICP and your intracranial pressure. So there will be certain signs and symptoms to look out for in a patient where you can be like, hey, they're having these symptoms happen. You know, this is indicative of an increase in intracranial pressure, right? So They've obviously, you could just see the results on the ICP monitor, but if maybe they're not, let's say someone that doesn't have an ICP monitor, right? So there's other things you can do to, to assess them to figure out if their ICP is rising. So signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. Um, the biggest one is change in level of consciousness. For those who don't know, triangle means change. I'm just in the habit of doing that. So, you know, if someone starts going in and out of consciousness, starts getting confused when they weren't before, starts being incomprehensible or saying things that make no sense, that's a big sign that something's going on in their brain and that needs to be looked at, okay? Um, the next one is people changes. 
So, you know, that's why pupil assessments are a big part of neuro. Um, you know, if they suddenly start constricting um, and not responsive to light or they get super dilated, um, you know, and they're not, they don't constrict even with a light shining in them, we call it fixed or a blowout if their pupil just stays super dilated and doesn't you know, ever constrict. Or maybe one eye is dilated and the other one is constricted and like these are kind of new changes. These are big things to suggest increasing intracranial pressure. Um, basically anything that changes with their GCS, the Glasgow Coma Scale. So if their motor starts acting fine, they start like curling in the corticate when they didn't used to before, it's like, hmm, something's wrong or their verbal or their eyes start changing, right? Another one um, is projectile vomiting, interestingly. Um, not really sure what the reason is behind it. Um, I guess it's just like that, that sick feeling of um, that increased pressure. And like, I don't know if you ever have like a really bad headache, make you feel nauseous, um, but projectile vomiting, specifically projectile, not just regular, but like you just spurt across the room. Um, headache. Obviously, patients will complain of headache, but not just any headache, like the worst headache they've ever had. Um, there's another thing um, called the Cushing's triad, and this one is related to vital signs changes. So this one, unfortunately, is kind of a late sign and symptom. You know how like certain things will happen faster than others. If they happen to have, if they are already at the stage where they're having um, these vital sign stages with the Cushing's triad, then it's kind of a late sign. So they've kind of been increasing with their intracranial pressure for a while. So I like to draw a triangle because it's a triad and do blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rate as the three points. So they'll have hypertension, increasing blood pressure. Again, well, think about it. If their ICP is rising, so right, the pressure in the brain, what's gonna happen to their blood pressure or their MAP? BP slash MAP, right? The pressure here is going to increase to compensate to get to get blood to the brain, right? So this is going to increase. Um, we're going to have bradycardia, so heart rate's going to go down, and irregular respiratory patterns. So you know, just kind of weird breathing issues, and this is called Cushing's triad. Um, another sign symptom is that if not addressed, an increase. Um, an increase of intracranial pressure without intervention could lead to herniation. Uh, if you don't know what that is, um, have you ever heard of like an abdominal hernia where it's like it parts of the intestine start poking through the abdominal wall. It's like kind of like a smushing out of the tissue where it's not supposed to be. So a hernia in the brain would look like parts of the brain matter kind of like being squished and pushed into places where it shouldn't be going. And that's obviously bad for the brain. Um, um yeah so those are different signs and symptoms uh, let's talk about some treatments for icp like what do you do about it okay now that you know that they're having increased intracranial pressure what can you do to kind of fix it or intervene right so um treatments well the first thing you want to do is decrease the cerebral edema, the swelling essentially. All right, so that's obviously number one. And you can do that with several different drugs. Uh, one's called Osmetrol. Another one, you can use Lasix, which is familiar with Lasix, diuretic. Um, dexamethasone. So this is a steroid. Um, and these, the use of these are controversial. Dexame dexamethasone and solumedrol. Um, the good thing about steroids is that they decrease inflammation, right? Which is what we need to, aim to, to decrease that cerebral edema. The bad thing is that we know that with steroids, it has a tendency to increase your blood sugars, right? And we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the problem, yeah, is the hyperglycemia that could be a potential problem. So that's why they're controversial whether or not we should use them. So yes, they do decrease inflammation pretty well, but they also have the potential to raise your blood sugars. And the problem with that is that um, the blood sugars, if, if your sugar is high, 
has the potential to put your brain into a hypotonic state. So um, I'll explain that in a second. Hypotonic. I don't know if you remember from this in anatomy and physiology, but there was hypertonic, isotonic, and hypo, hyper, iso, and hypo, right? And there's different types of IV fluids like normal saline, um, D5, and different things, uh, lactated ringers, and those are all different like isotonic fluids, hypertonic. What that means is what it does to the cells, right? So um, it has to do with water rushing into the cells. So water, a type of fluid that will cause water to leave the cell and go back into the bloodstream is going to make the, the blood, the, the cells shrink and get smaller. Those are hypertonic. Now, if it, the, the flow of water in and out is equal, that's going to be isotonic. So put hyper, iso, and then if your cell, all the fluid is going into the cell, making the cell get really, really big, this is hypo. I think hypo sounds a little bit like hippo, you know, like, I mean, obviously it's spelled different, but it sounds like hippo. And I think of like this big, you know, big fat, big creature. So like the cell is blowing up and getting bigger, like a hippo, right? And if we're trying to decrease cerebral edema, we're trying to make things shrink and get smaller and reduce swelling. But if all the fluid is rushing into the cells and can get bigger, that's hypotonic, that's gonna increase. That's gonna do the exact opposite of decreasing cerebral edema, right? And so, um, increased blood sugars create a hypotonic environment, which gives you this, right? Which is the opposite of what we want. We would prefer this, right? In this situation to make the, the cell shrink by getting rid of the fluid. Um, that's why we also don't give uh, D5W as an IV fluid um, because it creates the same problem. Um, okay, what else? Um, elevating the body or the head of the bed to 30 degrees, which we said already, keeping the blood sugars within normal limits, which we just explained why. So even if the patient's not diabetic, you know, monitoring their blood sugars, especially if they're getting a steroid, which might falsely raise their blood sugars. Also in trauma, oftentimes like people's blood sugars raise just because of the, all the different processes that go along with that. Um, and patients are often confused about that. Like, why am I getting blood sugar checks? I'm not diabetic. I have to explain like, We'll make sure your brain doesn't swell. Um, blood pressure control is another one. So again, we want their blood pressure to be a little bit higher than normal, right? You know, low blood pressure is good for cardiac patients, but we need higher blood pressure from neuro patients. So keep them in like the 140 to 150s. Um, so keeping that, you know, maybe giving them fluids, whatever it is, not this fluid, <laughs> a hypertonic or isotonic fluid. Um, we also want to do our best to prevent hypercarbia. So another big word here, hypercarbia. You might also hear hypercapnia. This has to do with increased CO2. We don't want to increase CO2. Why? Because CO2 or carbon dioxide is a vasodilator. And what happens when you vasodilate, right? It opens up, allows more fluid to go in, we want to, we want the, in the brain, we want it to constrict right now to keep, you know, you know, to push fluid out. Um, so let me read this real quick. Um, ventilation and there's constriction. Yeah, so we want to do that um, because that will increase the intracranial pressure. Um, so, you know, using oxygen, don't do, oh, the other thing is suctioning, um, trying to not do excess su suctioning, um, I'm trying to read my own handwriting, I'm sorry, this is from like eight years ago when I was in nursing school, uh, I think I might have like been rushing this to write, um, okay, here's the last one, right, prevent hypercarbia or hypercapnia, sorry, um, the last one is reduce cerebral metabolism. Reduce cerebral metabolism. You might be like, okay, what does that mean? Um, what we want to do is kind of cool the brain down a little bit. Um, 
so that it's not like <sighs> hyper functioning and doing a lot of things because we want the brain with we want to give the brain a rest right so you want to de-stimulate you want to decrease the stimulus we want to decrease um like kind of like noises and sounds and stimuli that are going to like increase brain activity. So we're trying to decrease brain activity to kind of keep it calm. So you want to decrease the body temperature, so decreasing temperature, um, but we want to do this slowly, okay? If we do it fast, it's going to cause the body to start going into shivers and we don't want to have them shivering because it's going to be like shaking them and like, you know, increasing the movement and also increasing like the brain awareness of like, oh my gosh, I'm freezing. So decreasing your temperature slowly and you can use like a cooling blanket. You can use like ice in the groin or whatever, just kind of like cooling the brain down. Um, you can also give some medications. So I'll put ice, but I think I should right over here. It's running out of space down there. Um, what else? Let's do, you can also put them into kind of like a false medic medical coma to decrease the brain activity, give their brain a rest. So they're not like awake and responding to all the stimulus of the noise, especially if in ICU, there's lots of beeping and stuff. So they call it a barbiturate coma where it's like a false coma uh, induced by medications. And some of those medications are phenobarb, or phenobarbital. Um, another one, um, let's see. Another thing you can give them, propofol. And again, some of these might be different years later. This is back in like 2017 when I took this class, but whatever specific drugs that are on your notes go off of that. I also have um, dexmedetamide, dexmedetamidine, I think that's how you say it. Um, some muscle paralyzing agents. Um, make sure that if you're giving any any muscle paralyzing agents, um, for example, I think of like becuronium, you must sedate them before you induce the muscle paralysis because that would be really scary if you're like awake and like alert and aware of what's happening and then suddenly like you're paralyzed and it also paralyzes the respiratory muscles. So you're like unable to breathe on your own, but you're awake and aware of it. So it's like you're suffocating and you're awake and you can't breathe because you're, you're, the medication has made you paralyzed. So they need to be intubated and, para and, and sedated before you give them any muscle paralytic agents. Um, otherwise they're just gonna like not be able to breathe and be awake and that would be terrifying. Um, okay, some anti-convulsants will help to decrease brain activity. So like Dilantin, Dilantin, Keppra, these are like, these also are like um, anti-seizure medications too. Um, to just all these different things are for the brain. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is um, brain death. And then we'll end on that. Um, so this is kind of a sad thing to end on, but um, this is all of what we have been talking about is to avoid the brain death, right? So uh, we'll end on that one. So we know what we don't want. Okay. Brain death. Okay, so brain death. Brain death is basically, you're still like, your body is still like alive in the sense that like your heart's pumping and you might have a pulse and like breathing, but there's no brain activity, right? So like you, this can occur, like the, the brain stem, if it's still functioning, it can still keep you breathing, whatever, but like as far as there being like any like cognitive like activity, there's just none. So it's not reversible, it's permanent. Um, and this happens before cardiac arrest, right? So like their heart can still be pumping and they'll be alive, quote. It's kind of like, it's kind of hard to say whether they're dead or not because people define death in different ways. Like 
if their heart's still beating, they'll say they're alive. But if they have literally no brain activity, they're also like a vegetable, um, which is considered dead too. So it's kind of like, depending on what your definition is. Um, so anyways, this is, you know, they, they call it precedes cardiac arrest. So they can still have a heartbeat with no brain activity. Um, if someone does have this, you want to try and contact donor services if possible, um, because only people that are having brain, only patients that are brain dead can donate a solid organ, which unfortunately is like 2% of the population that have, that are clinically brain dead, right? Um, so people that, that qualify, you know, meet the requirements for being labeled as brain dead, they can donate their organs if they're under the age 65 and they have no history of metastatic cancers, they don't have sepsis, and they don't have any diseases like hepatitis or AIDS, right? So um, in order to be established as brain dead, you have to have um, all of these things checked. So they have to be in a coma of known cause. Um, they need to have, in order to donate the organs, they need to have a normal or near normal body temperature. Um, so normal temp, reason being, you know, in order to, we have our normal body temperature like 98.6, right? If like person's body temperature plummets to like 88, right? Well, the organs are in an environment that's conducive to keeping them alive and functioning, right? So you want to make sure that the organs are like in, in position to like still be used, be used to be given to a, a recipient, right? So we got to make sure their body temperature is kept normal. Um, they have normal blood pressure. Um, again, because if their blood pressure is like 40 over 12, right? Well, obviously they're not getting very good perfusion. Even if their heart is still pumping, obviously there's not enough blood going to their organs. So their organs are probably actually becoming ischemic and probably dying slowly. And those are the kind of organs you want to like donate to someone like, hey, here's a liver that's been poorly perfused for like 12 hours. It's not going to be that great. Um, and then they have to have received a, a neuro exam by, you know, by a medical doctor to confirm that they've been um, clinically brain dead. And so they have to have all of these things or to be able to donate uh, their organs. Um, so let's talk about some more, some more things. Um, so in order to be considered brain dead, no responsiveness, right? So that they're in a coma. Uh, no pupil response, even to light. No pupil response. Uh, no gag or cough reflex. So you know how you can, um, if you tickle the little uvula hanging back there, it should in induce an involuntary gag. Um, they need to have no corneal reflex. And so we have something touch the cornea. It makes you kind of like, you know, jerk away from or blink your eye. Um, no corneal reflex. Um, this is an interesting one that was new to me. No oculovestibular reflex. O oculo vestibular. Now what this is, is um, they'll take a syringe and put ice water into the ear. And normally what's supposed to happen is there's supposed to be like eye movement, right? Like looking back and forth, like, because it, it just triggers that movement. When someone has no oculo vestibular reflex, there will be no eye movement. So all of these things are like no response, no response, no response. And these are what's considered making someone who's technically brain dead. Um, the next one is they have to have no oculo cephalic reflex. Now what this one is, is kind of creepy. <laughs> I don't know if any of you like have a one of those dolls with the eyes that move, right? So like if you, you were to take one of those dolls and like you move the head from side to side, the eyes will always like point up looking at you. So I don't know if I can, it's not creeping you out. It's like the doll's like facing this way and then you turn the head this way, but the eyes are still looking this way. You turn the head this way and the eyes are still looking that way. So that's the oculocephalic reflex. Um, so they won't have that. Um, and then the last one is they'll have no respiratory drive. No respiratory drive. So what this means 
is when you like, you know, you're seeing if the patient has the will or the brain function to make them breathe on their own. Some of them might be on a ventilator doing the breathing for them, but if they're not having any like in the presence of increased carbon dioxide, typically your brain's like, okay, it's time to breathe, to exhale, to get rid of some of that carbon dioxide and bring in some oxygen. But if you're brain dead and you don't even have control over the respiratory functions anymore, regardless of like however many, however increasing the levels are of carbon dioxide, you won't have a respiratory drive to breathe. Um, so these are some of the, uh, the tests that they do to clinically diagnose someone's brain dead. Um, so that's pretty much it. This is exactly what we're trying to avoid by being aware of ICP, what to do about it, things that can increase it, how to calculate it, all of those things. So I hope this was helpful to you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the video. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the, in the comments and I will do my best to get back to you.